Hello and welcome to Wineskins, a program that features the lives of the saints and reflection on the Sunday readings, along with information on a variety of topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Father Jim Corda. Our program is brought to you through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. Our interview segment today will feature Justin Hike. We will also get a glimpse into the life and times of Saints Cyril and Methodius, along with reflections on the readings for this sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time. That and more on Wineskins. To tell us more about life issues of health and wellness is Father Jack Lavelle. One of the greatest blessings throughout our diocese and many dioceses in the country is the establishment of quality health care institutions. In the Diocese of Youngstown, we have been blessed with several hospitals, nursing home facilities, retirement homes, many organizations and institutions which continue to care for all in need, especially when those needs are for those who are ill or suffering in any way. Since a Catholic health care institution is a community of healing and compassion, the care offered is not limited to the treatment of a disease or bodily ailment, but embraces the physical, psychological, social, and spiritual dimensions of the human person. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops' Ethical and Religious Directives for Catholic Healthcare Services continues to state all of these traditions are important. Whether or not you follow the Catholic religious tradition, you can take comfort in knowing that as a Catholic sponsored healthcare system, quality Catholic health care for the whole person, body, mind, and spirit, is always offered. We also understand that it is vitally important to offer spiritual care services to all our patients, their families, according to their personal preferences. Our Catholic health care tradition began many years before the Diocese of Youngstown was established, indeed, deep in our roots as part of the Diocese of Cleveland. Sisters, especially, began to provide quality health care in various hospital and nursing associations. We continue, in their vein, to honor the sacred dignity of life, the tradition that comes to us to this very day. Catholic hospitals and other health care institutions adhere to this fundamental belief. All life, from conception to the moment of natural death, is profound and sacred and must be treated with awe, respect, and dignity. Let's take just a few moments to look at the ethical and religious directives that help to direct all of our efforts as a Catholic healthcare institution. As a Catholic healthcare system, we operate according to these ethical and religious directives for Catholic healthcare services, often called the ERDs or the directives. This is the document that offers moral guidance on various aspects of healthcare delivery. The directives can be found also on the website for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. The Catholic understanding of health care is rooted in the basic scriptural understanding that the healing mission of Jesus touched people at the deepest level of their existence, and he sought their physical, mental, and spiritual healing. Throughout its history, the Catholic Church has been dedicated to serve the sick and all those in need. If we reflect simply on some of those more familiar stories of Jesus, we see those various healing stories. The blind, the lame, the woman caught with hemorrhages for many years, even to the point of raising Lazarus from the dead. In each of these cases, Jesus is restoring each of the individuals to a newer sense of health and happiness. And as such, the Church has always sought to model themselves after that healing presence of Christ. There are five principles of socially responsible Catholic health care. First, to promote and defend human dignity. The right to life of every human being means the right as well as adequate health care and must be basic to every Catholic institution involved in medical services and science. Next, to care for the poor. No one can ever be turned away from a Catholic hospital because of an inability to pay. This attention to the poor, the underinsured, and the uninsured must be paramount at our Catholic hospitals. Third, to contribute to the common good. Catholic health care services are meant for the entire community. 
These services should be instigators of social change that lead to a greater respect for fundamental human rights and for the economic, social, political, and spiritual health of the entire community. Next, to exercise responsible stewardship. As the bishops state, Catholic healthcare ministry exercises responsible stewardship of available healthcare resources. A just healthcare system will be concerned both with promoting equity of care to assure the right of each person to basic health care is respected, and with promoting the good health of all within the community. Finally, adherence to the moral teachings of the Church. In our society today, any Catholic health care service will be approached or even pressured to provide medical procedures that are contrary to Catholic teaching. But by refusing to provide or permit such medical procedures, Catholic health care affirms what it defines, a commitment to the sacredness and dignity of human life from conception until natural death. Again, in the Diocese of Youngstown, we have been blessed with a rich tradition of quality health care in all parts of our diocesan community. That health care continues in partnerships with various hospitals, the establishment of nursing homes and retirement facilities, and many clinics who continue to provide for the physical as well as the spiritual and emotional well-being of all our citizens. Additionally, through Catholic Charities, we are able to provide many services that continue to build upon the health and well-being of all who come in need. Let us continue to pray for all of those who are sick or suffering in our families, our communities, our parishes, and indeed throughout our diocese. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jack Lavelle. St. Cyril and Methodius were brothers. To tell us more is Brother Dominic Calabro. He is from the Society of St. Paul in Canfield and the production assistant at CTNY. These two saints were proclaimed co-patrons of Europe together with St. Benedict by Pope John Paul II on December 31, 1980. The feast itself is on the date of the death of Cyril, the blood brother of Methodius. They were born in Thessalonica, Greece, and became apostles to the Slav nations of Moravia, Bohemia, and Bulgaria. Their feast has been celebrated universally in the church since 1880. St. Cyril was ordained a priest at Constantinople and taught philosophy there. His older brother Methodius, after being governor of a Slav province, became a monk. In 862, the prince of Moravia asked for missionaries who would speak the language of his country. The two brothers, Cyril and Methodius, were selected for that task. They differed greatly from the Latin Rite missionaries from Germany because they were able to adapt to the people they were evangelizing. For example, they created a Slav alphabet and they translated the Bible and the liturgy into the Slav language. Hence, the characters were called Cyrillic. Cyril died in the year 869 and is buried in the Basilica of St. Clement in Rome. After being ordained a bishop, Methodius returned to the East as a papal legate to the Slav nations. During the last years of his life, he dedicated himself to the translation of the Bible and other works into Slavonic. He died in the year 885, and the funeral liturgy was conducted in Greek, Latin, and Slavonic rites. The first part of the opening prayer of the Mass recalls the great merit of the two brothers as missionaries who brought the light of the gospel to the Slavonic nations. Those countries rightly consider Cyril and Methodius as their fathers in the Christian faith. By introducing new languages into the liturgy of the church, they revived the prodigy of the early church. The two missionaries not only made the church resplendent by their work of evangelization, but they are models for the adaptation of the faith to various cultures. They understood the points of reference to the culture of the people, and they knew how to promote unity without imposing rigid uniformity. Because they laid the foundation for a truly Christian popular culture, Cyril and Methodius can also serve as reliable guides in the ecumenical movement. The prayer after communion evokes the Father of all nations who, through the one bread and the one spirit, has made us companions and heirs to the eternal banquet. We then ask that he will grant that all his children, united in the same faith, will be in full agreement in promoting justice and peace. All cultures of the Slavonic nations owe their beginnings and development to St. Cyril and Methodius, whether it was the creation of their alphabet 
or the translation of the liturgical books into the liturgy of the people. Ultimately, the work of these two co-patrons of Europe was an outstanding contribution to the common Christian foundations of Europe. For Wineskins, I'm Brother Dominic Calabro. With me today again is Justin Hike, who is the coordinator of media relations for the Diocese of Youngstown. Welcome back to Wineskins. Thank you, Father Jim. You know, Justin, last week you were with us talking about your position that you've had for the last about six months as media relations coordinator. Why is it important for us as church, first of all, to be involved in communications? And second of all, how do we use that in a positive way? Well, you know, we're using media anyway as human beings. So media is, it's not a something out there anymore. The uh, cultural experts talk about that we're living in a media culture continent. That's the world in which we live in our daily lives. And so the church needs to engage and use different forms of media and communicate through the media because that's where people are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's where they are embodied, so to speak. Their flesh is in using their phones on a daily basis and using the, the web on a daily basis. You know, as we uh, talk about having a relationship with media outlets, sometimes that gets to be a little sticky situation, I would imagine. And oftentimes there are things that happen within the church that we don't always like to talk about. But it's important, I believe, as communicators, as people who uh, represent the church, that we have a response, we have an answer, we have at least some kind of word to let people know that things are okay. And if they're not, this is why. Why is it important for us to kind of be able to not be afraid to communicate with people? It's true. You know, sometimes as church, uh, like any organization, frankly, in any community, there are sticky situations that uh, sometimes we're misinterpreted in how the church is living its mission. I've been really grateful, though, in the last number of months to get to know the journalists in the area, to get to work with them. That's an important primary part of my job as the coordinator of media relations as part of our communications team. And what I found is that the media, they want to get the story right. They need our help to understand the terminology we use, to understand how we are living discipleship as community. Even that word discipleship is not something that might be commonly understood. How do we follow Jesus? We were in partnership in a way with our media partners, our journalists that cover us, in addition to having our own particular role in expressing who we are. I'd like to talk now about kind of the future. What do you see the future for us as church here in the Diocese of Youngstown in regards to media relations and in regards to our use of communications, whether it's radio, television, print, social media? How are we going to move forward and transition into what we need to be as missionary disciples, but also in response to Jesus's call to be one? So one of the things that Bishop Bonner has called us to is to understand ourselves as one community, his Episcopal motto, that all may be one. And in communications, this is true too. Uh, It's true in our parish lives, in the ways that parishes are collaborating with one another. But for communications, it's so essential. And and I'm really excited by the ways we already are working together as one team. The team here at CTNY that will be coming into the diocesan offices as CTNY kind of is merged, in a sense, into our diocesan communications team, as well as how we're working together with the Exponent, our diocesan newspaper, and with our social media operations that we are one team using all of our resources in a smart way with our heads as well as our hearts, as I've heard a pastor I respect say. So that's an exciting development and in a way that is in some ways digital first because that's where people are first, but then also looks to how we use print media as well. You know, as communicators, and we're all communicators as followers of Jesus, some of us, especially that are out in the front, are very hesitant to talk with the media or very hesitant to be that communication tool outside of, let's say, Sunday Mass or Sunday worship. Why is it important for us to really be a spokesperson for the Lord in everything that we do? 
That's a great question. Uh, we are in the middle right now of uh, what's being called a synod or a journeying together. There's a number of questions that we've been invited to reflect on in regards to how we journey together as church. And one of those questions has to do with who do you see as speaking on behalf of the church in your local community? And it's a great question because there's a lot of answers to it. Mm-hmm. But one answer is this. All of us are called to speak on behalf of the local community. And we have a word for that. And that word is witness. We are all called to witness to the life we're living together and to discover the goodness in that life. There is oftentimes some news within the church that is extremely sensitive. And sometimes we have to be very careful of how we communicate that news, whatever that is and whatever that situation is. Why is it important for us to be transparent and to be honest and not to hide behind something? Because I think in the world of communications, especially in our world today, for us to be open and honest and transparent really should be a hallmark of the church. We've obviously had circumstances in our recent history in the last 20 years where we've seen where transparency, when we're not transparent, the scandal that has caused Mm -hmm. the child abuse crisis in particular. But it's true across the board. Sometimes I think we, and I think we saw this even when we started pursuing our pastoral plan, even before Bishop Bonner came Mm -hmm. to be with us, we talked about evangelization, that we have gotten so used sometimes to the, the goodness in our church that we forget that others don't see it. So we need to be transparent about that as well, about the good things that are happening. It is true that there are some sensitive matters, and sometimes there are stories, for example, right now when we're talking about the different ways that we're living parish life through parish mergers, for example. Mm -hmm. Those are sensitive because they matter to people, because people have long histories in their parish and in their churches where they worshiped. And we should pay attention to that. And at the same time, we need to make sure that we express that we've been developing our parish life over time and that we are living stones built into a holy house. And so the reason why we have to be transparent about the goodness and the challenges that we have is because if we're not transparent, the comments on Facebook are even more exciting than the truth that we're speaking. So let's speak the truth and let's speak the truth to the goodness that's happening in our community. What would you like to tell the folks that are with us about your position as coordinator of media relations and what they can do to help you in that position? So the coordinator of media relations is responsible for, and that's me, (laughs) responsible for uh, helping to develop the policies around communications in our diocese and then executing upon that. One thing that folks can do to be part of that is to pay attention to the the news outlets that that we have in the diocese, perhaps first (laughs) when we start to hear about church news. Pay attention to our diocesan website, doy.org. Uh, in our Facebook feed, our social media channels. And when you hear a news story break about the church, to prayerfully look to what we're saying. First, we release press releases about different matters, and we have different types of news to pray with that. And I think we all need to pray with that first before responding. Uh, It's a wonderful recommendation. I highly recommend that the folks that are with us heed your words. That way we can understand the truth and live by that as well. So Justin Hike, thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to your presence down the road back on Wineskins. And thank you for the wonderful work that you're doing to coordinate and to bring us together as one. Thank you, Father Jim. It's great to be here. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. For more information and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be right back. They say America is a land of opportunity. But for some of us, it's not so easy. Today, one out of every six children in America lives in poverty. Where every day is hard. And there's never enough. But we don't want a handout. We want a way out. This is America. Together, we can do so much. Will you help? Nearly 13 million children live in poverty. Make a difference. Go to PovertyUSA.org and get involved. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. Our song today is from the CD entitled Surrender. It is by David Kaufman and can be found at Good for the Soul Music, 
www.thepetsmedia.com. If you seek me with all your heart When you search me with all your being There you will find me And I will restore your soul And bring you home Though your heart Our scripture reflection for this sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time will be done by Deacon Mike Kajancic. He is from St. Charles Church in Boardman. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul writes, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now Christ has been raised. He wasn't actually the first to rise from the dead, for he himself had raised others from the dead. There was Lazarus, there was the twelve-year-old daughter of Jairus, whom Jesus said was just sleeping, and there was the son of the widow of Nain. And I wonder, whatever happened to those people? I've heard stories and read reports from people who claim to have been to heaven and have been given a second chance, and have watched many movies with that same theme of rising from the dead. One of my favorite movies is A Christmas Carol. And while Ebenezer Scrooge doesn't actually rise from the dead, he is given a vision of his death and its effects with the people he has interacted with throughout his life. He changes from that near-death experience. Those three I mentioned earlier, I think I'm safe in betting that their lives were changed, hopefully for the better. 
that somehow they came to realize they had been given a second chance. I don't include Jesus in that list, and for a good reason. You see, he didn't have to face death again, but the others did. He rose once and for all. And with his rising, our sins are forgiven. He represents us to God, and we know that we will also rise. Now, the vast majority of us will, in all likelihood, not be given a second chance to get it right. So we better make sure we get it right the first time. And that's why today's gospel is so important as to how to make sure we get it right the first time. The section we hear today is commonly known as the Beatitudes, from the Latin word for happy. They describe for us the life we are called to live to ensure our salvation. In a play on words, we could say Jesus is telling us to be these attitudes. They are the law of the new covenant, a new way to live life, regardless of the consequences that the world heaps on us. In reading the first part of each blessing, it really doesn't sound there's much to be happy about. There's a life of poverty, hunger, weeping, persecution, hatred, insults, and a series of woes. That's why it's so important to read the whole blessing, not to get depressed in the beginning, so depressed that we give up. The kingdom is ours, and you will be satisfied, will laugh, will rejoice and leap for joy. And that word will is important because it means not necessarily now, but in a time to come when God's power is fully manifested against the forces of evil in this world. Jesus is reminding us, as he always does, salvation is already ours, but we do have a choice to make. Do we want all the good stuff we can get as the world expects of us, or do we want the best later, what God will give us when we cross over? Remember, choose wisely. You may not get that second chance. For Wineskins, I'm Deacon Mike Kajancic. God calls us to open ourselves to acceptance, service, and commitment. It is only when we enlarge our attitude in that direction that we fully understand the breadth and depth of the mystery of God and His kingdom. Wineskins is made possible by the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. Wineskins is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm Father Jim Corda, thanking you for being with us. Have a blessed Sunday, and may God be with you. What have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today, because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.